Kia ora everyone. Um, if you're a guest with us today, my name's Jonathan. I'm the senior pastor here at, at GCC, and in my eyes, often a pretty bad as well. How, how many of you have had one of those big saver moments? Yeah, you know, you probably don't want to admit it, and maybe you can't even see me. I mean, that would be hearing, actually, if you can't. Anyway, the, um, you know, the, these, these moments, hey, when we have these, uh, you know, we go to the optometrists, and we're given a little wee um, chart to look at, and obviously, 2020 vision is that kind of clarity of vision, and some of you might be going, what is he even pointing to <laughs> right now? But, you know, this is 2020 vision, and, and we need that in life, because if we don't have 2020 vision, we make all sorts of mistakes, uh, sometimes really embarrassing mistakes. We get ourselves in all sorts of pickles, we, and we miss out on the opportunities that are right in front of us. And what's true with these physical eyes is also true when it comes to spiritual sight. God wants us to have 20-20 sharpness of vision so that we don't make these painful, embarrassing mistakes in life and we don't miss out on the opportunities that God has in front of us. You see, I believe God has a 20-20 vision for us, a clear, sharp focus of who He wants us to be and what he wants us to do as a church and as individuals. So um, the way we talk about that here as a church is uh, to be about renewing people and places, that we step in in partnership with what God is already doing in this world as he renews people and places in our homes, in our places of work, in our clubs, in our neighborhoods, like all around us as God is at work and we partner with what he's doing uh, in that mission of God. Now, as a leadership team, we have been praying about this year ahead, and we have sensed the Spirit giving us a, a verse or two for this season of, uh, of life, you know, in 2020. And uh, we've come to this verse that, um, from the prophet Isaiah. And uh, as a mouthpiece of God, this is what Isaiah said to the people. But forget all that. It is nothing compared to to what I, God, am about to do. For I'm about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry lands. And, and, and we've kind of been sitting on, on this verse because when Isaiah first spoke these words, he did so to a people who were discouraged. Uh, they had experienced a range of things behind them in this past season that they would never have signed up for. And Isaiah, as a prophet, he steps in and he brings this, these words of encouragement. He brings hope to what is ahead. And it's like God coming alongside them, you know, lifting up their heads and changing their focus from the past to the future and ensuring that they have hope as they think about the vision that God has in front of them. And as a pastoral team, we believe this is what God is saying to us. We believe God is lifting up our head to see and to anticipate the season ahead. He wants us to see with 2020 vision. You see, the Spirit of God has been stirring, and it happens more um, prominently in particular seasons. It's been happening here for some time. And as a pastoral team, we have noticed the palpable sense of anticipation, not just for, for this year, but for this season that lies ahead for us. We hear the anticipation building about initiatives like, like CityServe this weekend that we'll have in May when our church service is incredibly practical and we move out from here to go serve our city. Uh, the first one we had was back in 2017, and I still hear people talking about that and showing me photos of what they were doing on that particular uh, weekend that we had. And it's not actually just the weekend itself, because the weekend is really a taster to provide opportunities of different volunteer opportunities to make a difference in our wider city. I mean, what will it look like to make these relational connections with people and introduce people to Jesus? We see it in the way people are inviting friends and family to our services and to the various community ministries we have here. I think people have come to realize that uh, you won't be embarrassed if you invite friends to something we have here, and it's great to see. Uh, we see it in the dreaming and the sharing that takes place as people think about different things they can do and are doing and can kind of maximize it 
uh, to partner again with what God is doing to renew people and places in the day-to-day aspects of life. So again, listen to what Isaiah says here uh, uh, in Isaiah 43, but from the message translation now. It says, forget about what's happened. Forget about it. Uh, Don't keep going over old history. Be alert. Be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. I mean, don't you see it? I mean, there it is. I'm making a road through the desert, rivers and the badlands. So think about the image going on here, the badlands. When I think of badlands, I think of something like this, utterly parched, it's barren. It looks like nothing at all could ever grow here, apart from maybe some weeds that always seem to find a spot, right? It's badlands. But here God says he's going to make a road through the desert rivers and the badlands. So think about Auckland. Think about the barrenness that exists around us. Because God says, don't you see it? I'm about to bring life. I'm about to bring renewal. Because all around us are these parched people and places. And life is tough for many of them. Do you know that homelessness in New Zealand is the worst in the OECD? Did you know that 6,300 kids are in state care and 220 of those have been abused while they've been in care? Do you know that one in three women experience physical or sexual abuse from a partner during their lifetime? Do you know that one in 10 over 65 will experience some degree of elder abuse? You know that New Zealand has the highest death rate for teenagers in the developed world for both suicide and because of the road toll. On top of that, marriages are fragile. On top of that, people are just trying to kind of keep their head above drowning because of the pressure and the expectations that they feel. People around us are looking, hunting desperately for purpose and adventure in their lives, and that often takes them to these dark places and activities. And while, as you know, many people in New Zealand are are closed to discussions about God, did you know that still one in four New Zealanders would consider themselves very interested, or at least would consider exploring matters of faith? Based on a survey that happened last year, one in four would be very open to that. You see, friends, this is our 2020 moment. You know, we are called by the living God to bring renewal to the people and places of our city that we can be good news for our nation, moving from this parched, barren lives to allow God to do something new and fresh with His sustaining, nourishing hand. That's why we want GCC to be a place where people belong and thrive and renew. So this will be a safe place where the Spirit can transform and heal This will be a place where people are renewed in order to to change schools and places of learning and places of work and neighborhoods. This will be a place where new gifts are released and people encounter God in significant ways. A place where everybody is given the chance to be part of something bigger than any of us can do ourselves. This is a place where the poor will be given dignity and released into their gifts so they also can serve and make a difference in our city. This will be a place where people come to explore faith. That's why we have such an incredible alpha group happening on Tuesday nights. This will be a place where people who are new to New Zealand can come and settle and be part of our church family. That's why we provide things like free English classes throughout the week and and provide courses like alpha in, in various languages. This will be a place where people can experience practical help and counseling and life skills and job skills through things like our CAP ministries and Green Lane Care. This will be a place where people can take steps of baptism like like many people are doing next weekend. And by the way, if if you haven't been baptized and you're a follower of Jesus, I want you to consider doing that and chat to somebody after the service today. Uh, This will be a place where marriages are healed. It's why we'll be launching Alpha Marriage in Term 2 here at GCC. This will be a place where next generations can thrive and be equipped, not just now, but but into the future. This will be a place where people contagiously talk to people about Jesus. 
Because right now, 9% of our country knows nobody who's a follower of Jesus. Or at least they're not aware that they know anyone who's a follower of Jesus. So we need to talk to people about Jesus. And this will be a place where leaders are developed for both the present and the future. A place where people see that their work matters. It's a way that we live out the great commission and the great commandments and this cultural mandate like we saw last week. And this will be a place where people respond to the increase of fear around them, and they respond with love because love always casts out fear. And we proactively look for ways to be warm and hospitable to all peoples in every situation. And this will be a place where we find our identity and who God says we are. You see, church, this is our 2020 moment. Amen? Well, that's a bit weak. Amen? <laughs> But you see, there's a gap between our vision and the reality of that vision. You know, so how do we get from here, you know, where we are right now, to where God is calling us to be? What does it take to move from here to there? You see, there was another time when God's people had a vision in front of them. And yet they were still to experience the fulfillment of the there, the fulfillment of that vision that God had given to them many years earlier. Like us, for them, there was also a gap between the here and the there. The people in the story we're going to look at had traveled a great distance from Egypt through the wilderness. The massive group of people, some scholars estimate it was two million people in size. It was largely now a new generation in our story. They'd either been born in the wilderness or had left when uh, their parents had taken them when they were young, and, and all they had known was life in the wilderness living out of a suitcase and a bag, living in tents, moving from place to place. But they knew there was this promise that God had given to them that one day they would be in this land of promise. And they're now in this land because they had crossed the Jordan River in obedience to God, and they're in the land. But while they're now in the land, they don't yet possess the land. You see, there's a difference between being in the land and possessing the land. And in the same way for us, there's a big difference between the vision and the fulfillment of vision. Uh, some of our dreams are partially happening. Some have a long way to go. But still we see this parched land and people in front of us. We still hear these shocking statistics and we know behind each one of these statistics is a person that God deeply loves and cares for. And we hear about God doing something new as he renews people and places. This is our 2020 moment. But what will it take to move us from here to there? Well, between here and there are always obstacles. In fact, I've learned over time that the bigger the vision, the bigger the obstacles. Uh, for the people then, the obstacles had a particular look. That enemy was the Canaanites. The Canaanites dominated the land that God had promised to his people. And they were a terrifying group. In fact, the previous generation, you know, the mums and dads and granddads of this generation, we became so fearful about the Canaanites that they, uh, in fear, turned around and walked back into the wilderness and they died in the wilderness. Because when they sent spies into the land, you know, a few years earlier, they said this, we can't go up against, you know, those Canaanites. They're stronger than we are. And so they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. All the people we saw were huge. We even, even saw giants there. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. And so because of their, their lack of faith, they, they thought the obstacles were just too large. You know, God could never, you know, fulfill this, this dream and for us to experience that vision and move from here to there. And so they moved away from it. But now this new generation, the children of these very people have now crossed the Jordan River. They're in the land, but again, they don't yet possess the land. And so in our story, the people come to their very first obstacles, their very first encounter with these Canaanites. And the name of it is Jericho, the walls of Jericho. And it's an impregnable city. In fact, uh, this is how it begins in our story in Joshua 6. The gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go out or in. 
And so the people of God are looking at this obstacle in front of them. Archaeologists have uh, done some dig, digs in this area, and they have found that these fortified cities had walls as high as six meters high and two and a half meters thick. There's uh, you know area around these walls that was 27 foot wide, you know, embedded into bedrock. Uh, guards would have been stationed around the, the towers at the top, you know, able to, to take on any of the people of God who were trying to get over the, the walls. This is an impregnable city. No one has ever conquered Jericho before this in its history. Everything psychologically, though, depends upon a victory here, doesn't it? I mean, if they're defeated, the people are going to be pessimistic and going to return home just like the generation before them. This is a big challenge in front of them. And maybe you have some challenges in your life right now, too. Financial challenges, health challenges, new school obstacles, study choices, overwhelming projects or or just spiritual principalities that stand against us. You see, grasping a 2020 vision is one thing, but there's always these obstacles that stand in our way, these walls, these impregnable walls that you just can't get over. So how do we take our Jericho so that our story can advance? Well, as we look at the process they went through, a friend of mine pointed me to five steps that we see in this story. I'm going to share them with you today. And and these stories, uh, these steps really help us move from here to there. Now, we'll print some cards for you. And if you're just on the end of the aisles, if you can grab hold of that bucket and some pens and pass them along the row so that we all have one of these along with a pen. On the front is our, I guess, our 2020 chart, checking our eyes, making sure we have that 2020 vision. On the back is what it looks like to step into that vision. I want to talk through each of these points today. On the top right, and you probably need to have gone to Specsavers to actually see it, <laughs> um, it says, or at least I think it says, um, you know, I need a break. This is the area of breakthrough that I need in my life. So while I'm talking, you might want to write down some areas that effectively are your Jerichos, that you're trusting that God will bring breakthrough in these moments, and on the left is what we need to be doing if we're going to see breakthrough in these areas in front of us, to move from where we are to where God calls us to be. So, how do we take on Jerichos in our lives so that the story can progress. Well, here's the first one that you have listed down on the card there. Pray, and you listen, and you worship. So before the story of of Jericho even begins, Joshua meets this man, and he finds out that this man is the commander of the Lord's army. And so Joshua responds. Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence, I'm at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? But the commander of the Lord's armies replied, take off your sandals for the the place you're standing is holy. And Joshua did as he was told. You see, before before we even get to the story of Jericho, it's it's like there is this this sacred moment when, when Joshua comes face to face in this holy encounter with God. See, what I've discovered is there's often a spiritual battle that needs to be won before anything physically changes around you. It's one of the reasons worship and prayer is incredibly important, so vital, because worship and prayer are weapons to help move us forward. So we believe prayer and worship is vital here at GCC. And so it's why we're kicking off this ministry year with this focus on worship and prayer. So you heard Nathan talk about our Touching Heaven night on the 23rd of February, where we invite everybody to come for just an extravagant night where we just bow in submission to God and just awe of God and pray for our church and to pray for our city. And from that moment on, we begin, you know, 168 hours of coordinated prayer. So we have a designated prayer room, and we're asking people to sign up for at least one of those hours 
I'm sure the 3 a.m. shifts will be the most popular shifts for people to sign up for, believing in faith, right? So, you know, you sign up for these hours. Uh, I've already signed up for one of those early shifts. You know, I want other people to sign up too. You might want to sign up as a family or an individual or a small group, cell group, ministry group, whatever it is. Or you might want to stop in on your way to or from work. You know, we have a particular session just kind of open or a corporate prayer time at night. But find out the details, both either at our website or after the service. It's an opportunity for us to pray. Because before we see any breakthrough in our lives, it begins with prayer. It begins as we listen and as we worship. Now, part of that is we declare the promises that God has given to us. And that's what happens here in the story of Joshua. You know, before any action is taken, the victory was won with words of promise. The Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho. I've given you Jericho as king and all his strong warriors. Now, this is before he's actually experienced the walls coming down in this story. But God promises to Joshua. And this is what God does to all of us all the time. God promises something to us in the here, but it hasn't happened yet. And, and so we, we pray and we surrender ourselves to God in awe of him. But you see, friends, this is why we need to surround ourselves with the promises of God. Because so often we are surrounded by doomsayers. And then even for ourselves, we have all this like negative self-talk all the time. And if we listen to, you know, negative talk, we will just be defeated time after time after time. But we need to anchor ourselves in the promises of God. Because when we do that, we're able to move forward into the preferred future that God has for us. I'm utterly convinced that we need to surround ourselves daily with the promises from God's word, promises that we can claim right now. And so even while I'm talking, you might want to jot down here in the bottom right some promises that you know from God's word to be true about your situation, to remind you about the breakthrough that you need in your life. I asked our, our staff team about this over the past week, and here are some of the promises our staff jotted down and, and shared with the rest of our team. Uh, the way God says, I am able to do immeasurably more than all you can ask or imagine. And what a promise. I mean, just try to get your head around that one. Uh, I will be with you. You're the God of heaven with us. I will build my church. You know, the gates of Hades will never overcome it. Uh, all things are possible through Christ who strengthens me. I work all things for good. I mean, these are just some of the hundreds of promises that God gives to us. You know, anchor yourselves in the promises of God. That's where we begin. After we do that, though, there's a second step you can see here on your card. Not only do we pray, but we trust. We obey God regardless. So Joshua, you know, hears from God. He's listening away just after he worships. And this is what God says to him. The Lord said to Joshua, I've given you Jericho as king, all the strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Our seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you ought to march around the town seven times with the priests blowing their horns. And when you hear the priests give one long blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can. Then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. Now, what do you notice about what God asked Joshua to do? What I notice about it is that this is weird, <laughs> Really weird. I, I imagine like the internal dialogue going on for Joshua as God says to him, you know, so Joshua, each day I want you to walk around the city. Which I imagine Joshua at least initially says, yeah, God, you know, we'll do, you know, we, we can do that. That's, that's kind of easy. Uh, so I want you to carry, Joshua, I want you to carry like seven priests in front of all the people. And Joshua, who's um, actually a military leader, would probably look at that and go, 
Well, they're not really military leaders leading the way. They're priests, they're kind, of, kind of puny guys. But, okay, God, if you, if you want that to happen, you know, uh, yeah, I'll make sure that happens. Uh, what's next on the list? Well, Joshua, I want, I want the people, you know, I want the people at the front to blow the ram's horns. Uh, Joshua knows that the ram's horns were blown uh, as a display of victory coming. So as a military leader, he's probably getting well excited. This is the good part of the plan, isn't it, God? You know, victory is about to happen. Now, what do we do now? Do we uh, scale the wall, God? What do we do? And remember what God says? I want you to march, when you blow the horns, have the priests in front, and then come back to camp. Now, at this point, I would imagine Joshua in that internal dialogue going, God, sorry, I, I, I think I mis- misheard. <laughs> did, did you say you want us to return to camp? Well, don't, um, God isn't the plan to have, like, victory, to scale over the wall, to take on the enemy. No, Joshua, I just want you to return to the camp. Okay, God, well, what do we do the next day? Well, on, on day two, I want you to, to do what you did on day one. Just walk around the city with the priests in front, blowing the horn, and then come back to camp. And Joshua's probably there, God, this is really, this is embarrassing. God, we can't even, you know, taunt, we can't even mock our enemies. We're just going to be mocked ourselves. So God, please don't tell me that day three is the same plan. And God says, yeah, yeah, on day three, same plan, Day four, same plan. Day five, same plan. Day six, day plan. And then on day seven, I want you to do this seven times, to walk around the city seven times and then blowing that horn. And then I want the whole community to to shout out loud in victory, and then the walls are going to come down. You see, if you had a competition for the strangest way to win a battle against a fortified city that had never been conquered, I mean, this one wouldn't even make it on the brainstorming session, would it? You know, so why does God want them to do something so, so weird? I imagine it comes down to this whole idea that faith comes from trusting God. Faith comes from believing what God says and stepping out in obedience even when it doesn't sound right, even when it sounds strange to our ears. Because then we'll know that the victory, when it happens, can only be a God thing. See, you know, obeying the Lord is scary at times. I often feel completely overwhelmed. I remember that feeling just... Uh, a couple of months ago when I was invited to take on, on the leadership the, of, of our Auckland Church Leaders Group and, and just feeling completely overwhelmed. Like, God, really? Like, me? Like, what does that look like? And, and you just have that nervousness and that, that fear and all those things that start to well up inside of you. This is what it looks like, though, to step out and, and to do what God calls us to do. In your situation, how might the Lord be asking you to obey? What are some of the strange things that God says? You know, one of those strange things, for example, is the way God calls us to be generous with our resources. I mean, when you think about it, this makes no sense. I mean, we kind of need more to get by, don't we? And we hear the cry for more all around us. But God always calls His people to give. And it's actually that step of faith, that step of trust to say, God, I'm going to trust you with what you're giving to me, and I'm going to like allow other people to benefit from a share of that. And I'm going to believe that you will supply me with everything that I need. See, most things God asks us to do, we kind of initially reply with, huh, that doesn't make any sense. And many people around us, because it's so countercultural, will question it too. But this is what courageous faith obedience looks like? Will I trust and obey God even when what God says sounds nonsense? The third part, we pray, we trust, and then we are filled. We carry God's presence with us. Now, here in the story, you know, the priests who were leading the way at the front were carrying what's known as the Ark of the Covenant. This is a picture of what uh, people think it looked like. 
And so in this box were, were things like um, Aaron's staff that had budded, and it's like the, uh, uh, the tablets that God had inscribed um, you know, there for, with, with, with the law, um, some of the man, uh, manna from the wilderness that God had fed the people with. And, and this is where God had chosen to preside. God, God filled this box. And so as the priests were carrying this box, it was like the, the presence of God going in front of the people. And that led people to be afraid. I mean, God, God is leading the way. So as a people of God, we too are being called to carry God's presence. And we carry the presence of God into our places of work, into our homes, into our neighborhoods, into our relationships, into the business deals we have, into our lectures. So imagine tomorrow having the ark sitting on your desk. And, and a colleague comes up to you and goes, what's that? And you go, oh, that's just the ark of the covenant, you know, it's the presence of God. I, I wouldn't touch it if I were you. <laughs> Now, obviously, this is different for us. We don't, God doesn't reside in, in an Ark of the Covenant. He resides in you and me. That every believer has the Spirit of God, and we're called to be filled with the Spirit of God and to carry the presence of God. That same box that carried the power of God, so much so that enemies would fear it, the power of God is in us. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to us, you and me. And you take that God with you to work and to school. You carry the presence of God into your neighborhood. And though the obstacles in front of you look huge and look threatening, the presence of God is able to do immeasurably more than anything we could ask or imagine. Amen. The fourth thing we do here on your card is that we move, and we keep on moving. It's this idea of we persevere and we, we don't lose heart. See, I imagine for the people of God at this time, I was asking myself this, but you know, what would be the hardest day for me? Now, obviously, day one's pretty hard because you're stepping out and it just makes, it's kind of weird. But I would imagine it's, it's kind of when you return back to camp after day one and marching around the city and nothing has happened. And you come back to the camp and you have to do this again tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And those kind of middle days are really hard. At least on the last day, you, something has to happen or at least finishes, but it's those middle days. It's one thing to trust God at the beginning when there's a bit of a, maybe a pep talk or something that goes along with it. But the temptation is to give up. I mean, did God really say this to Joshua? Because this is nuts. I mean, let's just jump over the wall now and get it done. I mean, isn't this how it is for you and for me? We, we hear God's call to us, and we trust, and we step out on, on day one, and then we come back to our camp, and nothing has changed that day. The same walls of Jericho are still there, and they're just as strong as they were when we started. And then you step out on day two, and nothing changes, and you come back to camp, and it's still the same. The obstacle is firmly grounded just as it was before. And it's then that doubt and questions overwhelm us. Did God really hear my prayer? Did God really call me to this? Lord, do you really love me? Are you really able to heal this relationship? So you can understand what it was like if we have those questions, what it was like for the people here. And they've just marched around the city day in, day out, now six days. And then on the seventh day, God asked them to march around seven times. And get this, at the end of that time, uh, he says to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the town. Now, at this point, they must be tired. They must be discouraged. Nothing has happened. This is a faith thing to do, to shout in victory, knowing God is about to do something. Hugely discouraging for the people so far, I would imagine. But the people in faith still cry out in victory, knowing God is about to move. I think it's the same for you and me even though it sounds so absurd, but to, to not lose heart, to keep on moving, to keep on moving, to keep on moving, 
exactly what God tells us to do day in, day out, even when you don't see any progress being made. I mean, this is resilience. See, what God asks us to do really happens instantly. I mean, we live in this instant society, but God wants us to demonstrate faith. And faith is often forged in the waiting and the difficulty. It's an opportunity for us to show God how much we love Him and trust in His ability and His power. And we persevere and we don't lose heart. And after we move and after we persevere and after we keep on going and not lose heart, we come to the last aspect here on the card. To do it together. Together. We, we don't go it alone. Those walls come down and the, and the whole community flooded in. When the people heard the sound of the ram's horn, they shouted as loud as they could. And suddenly, the walls of Jericho collapsed. This is the work of God. And the Israelites charged straight into the town and they captured it. It's one of those only God moments. They all listened. They all followed. They all moved as one and they did it together. And the mission in front of us, renewing people and places in the city of Auckland, is not about a handful of heroes doing their thing. Instead, it's about all of us coming together, serving together, giving together. And that's why we use these three key words to describe what it means to be part of Greenland Christian Center. That we belong and we thrive and renew. Now, as a pastoral team, we make sure we provide a whole bunch of different opportunities in each of these ways, but, but it's about all of us stepping in to ensure we are actively part of each of these three. So to belong, we're a pretty large church, and so uh, you will never know everybody that makes up our church. I don't know everybody by name. I wish I did. But what's important is that we all have a place to belong that we are known and we know others and that we're part of a group and part of a team or, or part of a, a fellowship with other people. And so you can find out more after the service. There's a whole bunch of different uh, things in the, in the foyer where you can know what it looks like in each of these areas to take a step or to thrive. Renewal begins with us, that we come to know Jesus and then we allow the Spirit of God to change us from the inside out. That's why we have different classes and different resources to help you thrive. In fact, we'll have a Thrive Month again in June where every Wednesday we'll have different seminars for you to choose from. Uh, later in the year, we have a, a development planner that will kind of launch in, in April, May, helping you to think about what that tailor-made personal life learning looks like for you because it's going to be different for everybody. We want you to thrive and we want you to renew to use your time and energy and resources, not just for yourself, but to harness that and release it and power it so that it can be at work in the lives of a whole lot of other people in our city, serving and making a big difference around you. So I want you to keep this card in front of you in the season ahead because these are the actions, these are the steps needed to help move us from where we are now, the here, and move us to the there, to the experience, to the fulfillment of the 2020 vision before us. It will require us to pray, to trust, to be filled, to move, and to do this together. So listen again to this verse that our leadership team has sensed the Spirit of God giving to us this year. Forget all that, you know, forget the past. It's nothing compared to what I am going to do. For I'm about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. So friends, what is that obstacle in front of you? What's your Jericho? What's your wall? What's the breakthrough that you need? You know, in what ways is the Spirit of God prompting you, even this morning, to be this conduit of, of a river flooding into that dry wasteland around you? 
bring in renewal so that the places where just look dead and look like nothing could ever grow, suddenly they're flourishing. Because I can tell you, God is already at work, even in the most parched lives and parched places. And He is wanting to bring refreshment. And He is bringing renewal. But He wants you to partner with Him. And He wants... You didn't, he wants to know today if you will partner with what he's doing as you step into this 2020 vision in front of us. So I wonder if we can stand together. And just to pray, because it takes all of us, right, to step in and ensure that we belong, thrive, renew ourselves, and that we create an environment where others can belong and thrive and renew. So I want to pray just a three-word prayer at the beginning. It's probably the oldest prayer the church has prayed. It's just, come Holy Spirit. And when they prayed that, it wasn't praying because the Holy Spirit wasn't already here. But it was remembering what Paul said in Ephesians 5, to be filled, or really the tense of the verb is to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. So we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to come to fill us and resource us to move from here to there and to be these conduits of this refreshing river to bring change to these parched lives and places in our city. So let's, you might even want to put your hands out just to surrender yourself to God this morning. So come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Uh, Speak to us, Spirit. Guide us. Lead us. Resource us. Remind us that the victory is already ours. Help us to move with you, Spirit of God, to partner with what you're already doing in our city. And Spirit of God, would you bring your refreshing rain upon each person here? And would you nourish the parched places in our own lives and enable new life to begin and new life to flourish And would you enable us to be conduits throughout our city in every sphere that we live and work and breathe. That there would be change happening all around us of goodness and of grace and of all the values that we hold tight. So come Holy Spirit. And as you promised to do a new thing, we come as a community of faith. And we want to step into that new reality and follow after you with anticipation and hunger and thirst. Thank you that you use ordinary people like us to do extraordinary things because of your power. So come Holy Spirit, lead us, refresh us, renew us. In Jesus' name, amen.